Hello listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of The Conspiracy Vault. Today I am going to be talking about the mysterious disappearance of Shelley Miscavige, the High Priestess of Scientology and wife of leader David Miscavige. She has not been seen publicly since September 2004. David Miscavige was born April 30th, 1960 in Pennsylvania, America. He was born to his mother Loretta and musician father Ronald Miscavige. David grew up with his brother Ron Jr. and two sisters Denise and Laurie. Ron Jr. would later go on to have a daughter named Jenna. And Jenna Miscavige Hill has become a prominent voice in speaking out against Scientology. She explores her thoughts and feelings in her compelling book Beyond Belief. David was athletic growing up. He enjoyed sports, running, baseball and physical activity. However, his efforts were impeded by his asthma. Ron mentions in the ABC News series on YouTube that in 1968, as an aspiring musician and trumpet player, he learns about Scientology at a business meeting. He says, quote, I didn't know what I was looking for, but I knew I was looking for something, end quote. He began going to Scientology meetings and realised that they seemed to have a lot of answers to life on a basic level. He mentions in the ABC interview that Scientology suggested that through auditing and the e-meter process, something talked about extensively in my previous episodes, that the church could heal nine-year-old David's asthma. And four hours later, sure enough, David emerged from his auditing session. He had attended this without his father or a guardian present, but he looked at his father and said, quote, Dad, it's handled, end quote. Ron talks of how he wasn't sure if it was faith healing or a miracle, but he was convinced that the auditing session had at least mitigated the effects of David's asthma. After this, the miscarriages were sold. Ron and his family joined Scientology in 1971. At the age of 16, David leaves school and officially joins the Sea Organisation. What is the Sea Organisation? Well, the Scientology website summarises it this way. The Sea Organisation is a religious order for the Scientology religion and is composed of the singularly most dedicated Scientologists. What we have learned from testimonies and interviews is that members of the Sea Org sign a one billion year contract to the Sea Org, promising their eternal services each time they return to a new body on Earth. Again, if you haven't listened to my previous episodes on Scientology, going back might help to shed some light on Thetans and the belief system of Scientology. The Sea Org members donned uniforms similar to those L. Ron Hubbard would have worn during his time in the Navy. L. Ron Hubbard was the founder and leader of Scientology until he passed away and David Miscavige took over. The uniforms worn also present in the same regimented-like fashion that the Navy uniform does. It is suggested by those who have left the Org that the harsh treatment, hazing and manual labour is similar to that of military services too. David moves to Clearwater, Florida to one of Scientology's headquarters, and becomes a fully-fledged member of the Sea Organisation. It took David only six months of being in the Sea Org to find himself working along L. Ron Hubbard himself, or LRH. David has landed the position of cameraman, assisting LRH and his team in making Scientology adverts. It was during his time in the Sea Org that David met Shelley. Shelley had signed her $1 billion year contract and joined the Sea Org years before, when her mother signed over guardianship of Shelley to LRH when Shelley was only 12 years old. David and Shelley were both very committed to the church and to the Sea Org. They founded their strong bond on their similar devotion to Scientology and LRH. Their relationship grew and by 1982 they married in Los Angeles. They instantly became known as the Scientology power couple. In 1985, David's father Ron was arrested for attempted rape. Although Ron claims it is just a case of mistaken identity, David arranges for the charges to be dropped. After this, Ron felt like he owed something to David and the church, and so he divorces his wife and he joins the Sea Org himself, becoming a more devout member of the Church of Scientology. Once Ron had joined, he mentions to ABC a sudden difference he noticed in his son. David never addressed Ron as dad or father, and when Ron would smile and say, hey David, his son would turn and look at him in a way that was threatening, in a way that suggested that he didn't see him as his father only as another staff member. This could be put down to the church's belief that family dynamics are false and no spiritual being is the father of another spiritual being. Ron realised at this point that the relationship with his son would never be what it was ever again. According to research, David continued to get closer to LRH 
until Hubbard eventually died in 1986. David gave an infamous speech announcing to the world that LRH had, quote, discarded the body he used in this lifetime and, quote, the body he had could no longer serve his purposes, indicating to followers and the world that LRH had simply left his mortal bonds behind, shedding his skin so that his spiritual Thetan could be free to continue the work it needs to and that LRH is not really dead. It is heavily suggested that LRH actually died of a stroke. Soon after this, a year following LRH's death, David Miscavige takes the title of Chairman of the Board of the Church of Scientology and effectively replaces LRH as the leader of this religion. David claims that LRH is communicating with him and that it will be David who finishes writing the OT levels that each member must complete to climb the total bridge to freedom. So by this time, David Miscavige has gone from child to auditor to Sea Org member, to Commodore's messenger, to cameraman, to LRH's number two, to leader of the Church of Scientology. He is 27 years of age. Ron recalls how the Sea Org began to worsen in the following years. He described to ABC, quote, crushing workloads, restricting rules, constant stress, rigid lifestyle and lack of sleep, end quote. Ron also recalls how David's attitude towards him continued to change. He mentions being on stage performing in the late 1980s and when he came backstage, David took Ron aside and spent 55 minutes yelling and cursing at him, tearing him apart. Ron also mentions that this is something that happens repeatedly. The next time it occurred, there were many onlookers who just watched Ron being berated by his son. Jeff Hawkins, a former Scientology member who was in charge of the church marketing, wrote in a book called counterfeit dreams and violence that David has physically assaulted him on at least five occasions. There are also suggestions that David staged a coup to reach the status of leader. Other members who have since been removed from the church claim that David was referred to by everybody, including LRH, as the boy when he was working on the cameras, filming Scientology material. It is suggested by these members who are no longer in the church that David gathered a band of devout followers leading up to and after LRH's death that ensured he would gain the votes and be in the correct position to swoop in and take the title of chairman of the board when the time came. Another prominent figure who has spoken out so vocally against the church is Leah Remini, Hollywood star and actress. Leah released her own book called Troublemaker in which she speaks of her time within Scientology and the evil within it. She tells 60 Minutes Australia that she was once summoned to HQ in Clearwater, Florida and underwent four months of intense auditing. This was because of apparent crimes against the church. Leah described it as interrogation. She was being asked things like, what are your crimes against Scientology? What are your intentions towards Tom Cruise, towards L. Ron Hubbard and the church? She said that this only ended when she admitted to things that she didn't believe, like David and Tom are amazing and that they would be responsible for saving the world. Only then was she allowed to leave. And of course, she had to pay for this auditing that cost her $300,000. Mike Rinder, also an ex-member and whistleblower against Scientology, speaks of being put into the hole, two double-wide trailers with bars on the windows and doors. According to his interview with 60 Minutes Australia, he was sent to the hole for two years. In the hole, it's been reported that people would be starved, forced to sleep on the floor and often subjected to physical beatings. In 2005, it is reported on 60 Minutes Australia by longtime whistleblower and ex-member Tony Ortega that while David was away on a trip, Shelley finished some paperwork on David's behalf. When he returned, Tony recalls David, quote, threw the worst temper tantrum and a week later Shelley vanished, end quote. It was in 2006, at the wedding of the year, that Leah realised something odd. Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes were getting married on the 18th of November 2006 and according to Insider.com, Holmes and Cruise sealed the deal with a very lavish wedding in the 15th century castle in Italy. Holmes wore an Armani gown and the two had a double ring Scientology wedding as per People's Report. But one thing was missing from this huge wedding event, an event that David Miscavige attended close to Tom Cruise's side and that was David's wife Shelley who had never missed such an event and was never absent from David's side at events so high profiled as this. This was such a huge event for Scientologists worldwide and to see David there without his wife caused alarm for Leah and many of her supporters and ex-members of the church. 
An article on TonyOrtega.org reads, Until her disappearance, Shelley not only helped run Scientology as COB assistant to her husband David, the chairman of the board, but she was also seen at annual Scientology events and took the initiative in major operations. Just before the year in 2004, she had spearheaded an effort to find a girlfriend for Tom Cruise, for example, and had young women audition for the role. So it was extremely unusual for Shelley suddenly to be gone even though some people didn't notice it for a while. For Leah Remini, it was when she was at the Tom Cruise Katie Holmes wedding in Italy more than a year later, in November 2006. It dawned on her that David Miscavige was there without his wife, and when she asked about it, she was told by Tommy Davis that she didn't have the fucking rank to ask that question. When Leah left Scientology in 2013, she was still asking the same question. Where is Shelley Miscavige? And so she asked the Los Angeles Police Department, which responded to a missing person report by visiting Shelley and getting her assurance that she was all right and didn't want to make a public statement. When we asked LAPD officer Andre Dawson if his two detectives who met Shelley did so in the presence of other church officials, he told us, quote, that's classified. Even before Leah Remini came out of Scientology, however, We'd been writing about the strange disappearance of Shelley Miscavige. The Tony Ortega article goes on to say even before Leah Remini came out of Scientology, however, we'd been writing about the strange disappearance of Shelley Miscavige. And we've worked hard to investigate her whereabouts through multiple independent sources. And all of those sources point to one place where we believe Shelley has been living and working since 2005. The Church of Spiritual Technology headquarters compound near Crestline, California. So it is suggested that in 2005, while David was away, that Shelley finished some paperwork without David being present. Long-time whistleblower and ex-member Tony Ortega tells 60 Minutes Australia that David then goes on to have this worst temper tantrum ever, and a week later, Shelley vanishes. The TonyOrtega.org website has a lot of other articles on this subject that I was able to find in the archived section of the Scientology subreddit. So a shout out to you guys. And a part of one of the articles reads, Several different lines of evidence have convinced us at this point that she was moved to the CST headquarters and she's been living and working there ever since. Shelley was only seen in public one time since then, in the summer of 2007, when she was allowed to go to the funeral of her father in the presence of Scientology handlers. Another Tony Ortega article offers more information saying Leah filed her report on a Monday. We found out about it two days later and reported on it Thursday morning, but that Thursday afternoon, as other reporters called the police department, the LAPD told them that the report was unfounded and that Shelley wasn't missing. We called LAPD's officer Andre Dawson, who told us two of his detectives had personally met with Shelley and that she told them she didn't want to make a public statement. We asked Dawson if that interview had occurred in the presence of other church officials and again he said that's classified. We couldn't help noticing that Dawson subsequently showed up fairly often in Scientology promotional materials as he was featured at community events held at Scientology facilities. Since then, the drumbeat of Where's Shelley has only gotten louder as the church refuses to provide any information about where she is or why she no longer appears at church events with her husband. But it is true that Shelley isn't missing. David Miscavige knows exactly where he's keeping her and will keep her until she dies. In the ABC interview with Ron Miscavige, he goes on to say, quote, Shelley is alive, but she has no hope of going free, end quote. Some supporters believe that she may have been killed. Some believe she is in a basement being brainwashed. Some speculate that Shelley is being held on Scientology property under strict garden observation. It is feared that we may never know. Shortly before Leah Remini left the Church of Scientology, Ron was gifted an Amazon Kindle from his son David. Without realising it, this Kindle had access to the internet and Ron used this technology to do a simple web check on Scientology itself. What the results showed were masses of negative media exposure on Scientology and the word cult being tightly associated with it. Ron had been sheltered from any negative fallout and opinions of the church, much like many of the other followers. So when he began reading more and more about the public opinion of the church worldwide, he realised that something was terribly wrong. 
and those red flags in doubt had not been misjudged. On the 25th of March, Ron told his wife Becky, pack a bag and act normal. When we leave this compound today, we are going to turn left and we are never going to come back. Ron tells ABC how it had to seem like part of their daily routine and that if their plan would have been discovered, Ron would have been under constant guard for the rest of his life. He tears up during this interview with 60 Minutes Australia as he recalls Becky calling her brother and telling him, quote, we are coming home, end quote. This was 2011-2012. He had planned his escape for six months. He later published his own book about Scientology called Ruthless, which Scientology have said is full of half-truths and outright lies. Leah Remini leaves in 2013, and by 2017, according to themirror.co.uk, Katie Holmes went public with her romance with Jamie Foxx, and many wondered why it had taken so long for them to confirm things. This was because, according to the terms of her quickie divorce from Tom Cruise, it was reported that Katie wasn't allowed to mention their marriage or publicly date anyone for five years after the split. A source told Radar, She's allowed to date, but cannot do so in public fashion, and she's not supposed to let any boyfriend near her and Tom's daughter. Another strange event to mention is the death of Mary Florence Fike Barnett, Shelley Miscavige's own mother. I found a perfectly detailed article on secrets with yentruck.wordpress.com, which is Courtney spelled backwards. Courtney has a website where she looks into suspicious events and writes about them. So I can't take any credit for what I'm about to read. This segment was found entirely on Courtney's page. I will leave a link for her website in the show description and also shout out her work on social media for anyone who would like to follow more of her writing. The segment reads, The Death of Flo Barnett. Mary Florence Flo Fike Barnett was born in Missouri, June the 7th, 1933, to parents Edward E. Fike and Frances Merle Mahan. She had a brother, Merlin Fike, and was married twice. Her first husband was Maurice Elliott Barnett, with whom she had four daughters, Clarice, Michelle, Camille, and Matari. The girls were all born in Dallas County, Texas. Flo's second husband was James Jim P. Miller. They lived together in California. At some point in their lives, Clarice, Michelle and Flo were all members of Scientology. On September 8, 1985, in Carlson, Los Angeles, California, 52-year-old Flo Barnett was shot to death in her California home with a Ruger 10-22 rifle. She had three gunshot wounds to her chest and one to her head. Her husband, James P. Miller, found her body. The County of Los Angeles conducted a homicide investigation at the Forensic Science Centre and the chief medical coroner later ruled the death as a suicide and that it was an open and shut case. Would her death have been further investigated if authorities knew she had departed from Scientology? This is the evidence for suicide. Suicides by rifle are common and almost always end in death. Every year at least 21,000 Americans die by gun suicide each year and 90% of the attempted suicides by guns are fatal. Detective Bob Havercroft was the main investigator on the case, and he is persistent in the fact that the death was a suicide, pointing out that the wounds on her wrists indicated that she had attempted suicide prior to the shooting. She had surgery for an aneurysm that had left her debilitated and depressed. One of Flo's daughters, Camille Barnett, claims that her mother's surgery, Flo mentioned to have no hope of getting better, Camille also walked in on her writing something on a piece of paper which Flo immediately claimed to be a letter to the doctor. There were two more suicide notes found in the room Flo died in. Havercroft states that he was able to prove it was a suicide by the way he would reconstruct the body and position of the gun, etc. The autopsy report also describes the three gunshots to the chest as following. The course of the three projectiles is through the skin and soft tissue. One projectile does pass through the breast implants. One bullet also passed through a lung, breaking her ribs. Because the coroner had difficulty indicating whether the death was suicide or murder, they had to rely on the detective's conclusion that it was a suicide. But these are the assumptions of murder. A Ruger 1022 rifle is not exactly a recommended weapon for self-defence compared to its counterparts, but it is deadly, and two gunshots to the chest are enough to kill someone. Flo was 5 foot 3 inches and 114 pounds and the rifle's 37 inches in length would be nearly impossible for her to pull the trigger on her own so many times. One of the bullets passed through Barnett's left lung and broke her rib, begging the question how could she have possibly continued to shoot herself with a rifle in such a condition 
especially considering she was already debilitated from surgery for an aneurysm. Prior to her death, Florence Flo Barnett, once a devout follower of Scientology, joined David Mayo's Advanced Ability Centre, an enemy breakaway organisation that rejected David Miscavige's leadership of Scientology. A week before the shooting, Flo had obtained NED for OT's material. New Era Dianetics for OTs, a series of auditing action delivered as part of the OT levels, developed by Hubbard during his research of New Era Dianetics in the 1970s, and threatened to sue the church. The church views ex-Scientologists as people who denounce Scientology as suppressive people and squirrels, i.e. heretics. Vicky Asnaran, once a high-ranking member of Scientology, testified that David Miscavige was disgusted to be related to Flo and in response to his mother-in-law's death said, quote, the bitch got what she deserved. Shelley Miscavige also appeared to lack grief for her mother's death, stating that she was doing very fine and this was an excellent opportunity to find out where the NED for OT's material had come from and to use it as leverage against Mayo. In Asnaran's original affidavit, she claimed that Flo's death was a scandal within the inner circles of Scientology. In a second affidavit, she denounced her first affidavit stating that it was written without her approval and that the miscavigers were very upset about Flo's death and Flo died of natural causes. Suicides and murders, however, are not naturally caused deaths. When you find your wife dead with multiple bullet wounds, you are going to be a possible suspect for murder. Detectives at first suspected James P. Miller, Flo's husband at the time, for murder, but he was immediately cleared, perhaps doing a good job convincing the detectives that he did not kill her because DNA-based evidence was not available in the United States until 1987. Police could not test to see if Milner's fingerprints were on the weapon or venture the possibility of Flo's death being assisted suicide. The cause of death resulted in the coroner's office to declare it as a suicide because of what the detective's testimony... Of course, one may be wary when trusting the LAPD detectives for numerous reasons, one being that ex-Scientologists believe that the LAPD protects the Church of Scientology. The LAPD also protects the Church's crimes. They are always willing to lend its support for Scientology, and the Church in return rewards and heavily funds LAPD with large checks. If David Miscavige wanted to hide something or someone, he has the money and resources to do it. There is no public record that Flo Barnett's case will be reopened for further investigation. Her death was ruled a suicide more than 30 years ago and will remain so indefinitely. It is evident that Flo Barnett most likely did not commit suicide, at least not on her own, and the church did their job in protecting themselves from suspicion or prosecution. But Flo's case is not the only suspicious death connected to Scientology. High-ranking members of the church are responsible for decades-old cases of fraud, abuse, abductions and death. But their money protects them. It seems that billion-dollar corporations in the United States have limited boundaries, allowing them to do the unthinkable, allowing them to run a secret prison facility to imprison misbehaving members. So thank you, Courtney, for that amazing piece of work. Again, you can find her website at secretswithyentruk.wordpress.com and I will post the link in the episode description. On top of this, I found a YouTube video by Anonymonkey titled Victims of Scientology. It's a video that shows lots of different names with descriptions on how these people died. It starts with Lisa McPherson, who was found dead in her room in Fort Harrison Hotel after being held there for 17 days. Her autopsy showed that she was underweight, dehydrated and had bruises and insect bites on her body. Lisa had been put into introspection rundown to help her through her mental breakdown, but was instead allowed to fall into a coma and die. She was only 36 years old. Quentin Hubbard, LRH's son, was found in a car two days after disappearing from his home. The engine of the car was on, and a hose ran from the exhaust to the window, making it appear to be a homicide. However, the license plate of the car was missing and found under a rock some distance away. His wallet was also missing and there were needle marks on his arms, and Quentin was not a known drug user. Terry McCann, Mary Stouffer and Sandra Merceforth all died whilst on the purification rundown. None of them received proper medical care. Noah Lottick jumped to his death from a 10th story window. His last $171 were clutched in his hand. Heribert Pfaff and Josephus Havanith both died in the Fort Harrison Hotel. Heribert died of a seizure after his epilepsy medication was stopped in favour of the programme of vitamins. Wilhelm Mack was found hanged in his garage. 
There was older dry blood in his ears and a scarf had been stuffed into his mouth. No autopsy was performed. Ellie Perkins was killed by her son Jeremy. Jeremy was an untreated schizophrenic and on LRH's birthday he stabbed his mother 77 times. Rodney Romando was 27 years old when he reportedly killed himself by jumping from a sixth story window. The suicide note found was not written in his hand and it made reference to his wife. Rodney was a single man. Diane Morrison died of cancer. Scientology doctors refused to let her have chemotherapy and instead prescribed vitamins and auditing. Eric Rubio starved to death. He was thrown out of the Sea Org and forced to pay back loads of money. When he died, he was just 36 and weighed 45 kilograms. Of course, the links to Scientology among these cases are mostly speculation and some should be taken with a pinch of salt, but the fact that these can all be linked back to Scientology is definitely food for thought. 60 Minutes Australia visits the Church of Spiritual Technology where devotees are just transcribing LRH's writings onto titanium plates to be locked away in a vault in order to survive the end of the world. This is where some believe Shelley is being kept. You can see the cameras on every tree, every house, every gate, every square inch. A Scientology spokesperson tells 60 Minutes that their request to interview David Miscavige was preposterous and a lawyer acting for Shelley Miscavige told them she isn't missing and she is disgusted with Leah Remini for suggesting that she is. So this marks the end of my coverage on Scientology for now. What I think is important to take away from this is that on a basic level, Scientology and Dianetics seems to genuinely improve well-being and promote a positive frame of mind. However, the coercive control and manipulation that seems to be forcibly applied above the basic level is cause for great concern, especially when the model for Scientology will not work unless you continue to move through the ranks, meaning that remaining at a basic level doesn't seem possible. So I will leave you with this quote from Ron Miscavige. This church is not a church, it's a cult. Find me at cultvoltpodcast at gmail.com or on Twitter and Instagram at cultvoltpod. I'm your speaker Casey and this has been The Conspiracy Vault.